represent a sense of hope among the peoples of this community, and especially the students. And I found that interesting because most of my life has been committed to hope. I don't know that any other word really defines me better than that. I was born into poverty. Poverty was my mother's midwife. She came to this country as an immigrant woman with no education from the island of Jamaica. And she saw the promise here that she heard about. And she came here looking for the fulfillment of that promise. Only to find that uh, it was denied. She came here and found a new life and struggle. She became a single parent because my father abandoned us very early on in life and left us to the ways of the streets of an intimidating city called New York and a vibrant little village within that community called Harlem. And all of the pain and the anguish that met my childhood, I was also rewarded by the fact that I lived in that particular place. It was the black cat. It was ironic that by law, we lived where we lived in the segregated place. But it was also a divine intervention that because of that law, I was able to meet and to fairly have a relationship to many who became my mentors. I saw Paul Rose. I saw Dr. Duncan E. Du Bois. I saw so many people that early on helped shape America. I met some of the great black writers, Sora Lee Hurst, James Weldon Johnson, and others whom I did not know at the, about the magnitude of intellectual power, as well as the artistic and philosophical gifts. But it's enough to say that my mother constantly, in her own way, charged us with the responsibility of paying attention to what these people said and what they did. Although her life was filled with disappointment, not greater than the fact that I came to her one day and said, I'm dropping out. I can't deal with the demands of and the disciplines of the educational system. I suffered terribly from mental adjustments to the process. In those days, nobody knew anything about dyslexia. All they knew was that this young kid in this classroom didn't seem to live up to his expectations, and he live up to anything that suggested he should be doing infinitely better than he did. And this clash left me always on the teacher's report, the principal's office's report, saying he is hopeless. And although that charge constantly badgered me into thinking of myself in an inferior way, I got lucky that I had the mother I had. She took her disappointment and embraced me in a way, and my brothers and sisters, in a way that helped get us through the social milestones. She was in love with Franklin Delano Rosa. Whenever a fireside chat came up, we were riveted to our little radio. One room kitchen in which we lived to hear what Roosevelt had to say. And she was inspired by his thoughts and his insight. And for this black woman from the Caribbean to find this much to be inspired by, for a man who sat some far away things none of us would ever know, was always for me a curiosity. But she listened, she poor. And she loved Marcus Garvey because he grew up in her own village in Aboga. And 
Chronicles of Jamaica, the very primitive rural environment. It's a good pride in what he talked about and what he wanted for us. And all I knew was that I was constantly being drug off to places where I'd have to listen to the voice of Marcus Garvey or those who were his disciples on black mission in the universe. You have to understand that that was somewhat difficult because those of us who are of Caribbean extraction, we view race in many ways as quite different from the way African Americans view race. Our association, our oppression, the style of our oppression, the way in which our oppressor manipulated the landscape in which we were required to live was a little bit different than the way in which we saw race and the way in which slaves in America were manipulated. It was a very different. Not in the essence of its oppression, oppression is oppression, but in the style of it which gave some of us opportunity to see things a little differently. So what I'm saying is that in fact when I came to America, although I had an Africanness, I was an immigrant within our own black community. Everybody else in the community came from Alabama, Mississippi, and so on. So on. <laughs> All I knew was that they were the West Indians over there. <laughs> and uh, all my life I had this conflict between being American and being Caribbean and all the complications that came trying to identify myself just in those two societies. Both well, studies have been done on this, and I'm trying to inspire some students how to take the people look I can afford to give them the research money to go and say, let's talk about the subtleties of race and the meaning of race in a higher sense than you understand it now. Because there's something going on here where no matter what we do, we can never seem to overcome that hurdle. As much as we have been through and all that we have seen, to come to this moment where in America, we should have a black man standing as the President of the United States of America, would suggest that all the one about the issue of race has been settled. Except in the execution of his responsibilities, it's amazing how race has resurrected itself, demonized us, crush us, set us apart, have this fearsome struggle going on, although it doesn't always result in some black person hanging from a tree as a physical expression, there's a lot going on that's hanging with psychologically. That hanging affects itself when you look at the prisons of America, if you look at the inordinate number of young black men and women who languish in those prisons because justice did not understand its fullest responsibility. Justice is not just about when you stand before the judge and he says guilty or not guilty or sentences. Justice is in every aspect of our life every day. How much have I been permitted to learn? How much have I been, I've been permitted to participate? Where does justice lie in the choices that I have every day? In the absence of justice because of race, then your life is filled with nothing but experiences that are thought the cruelties of injustice. So my mother would speak about the Second World War. After all, Jamaica was a colony of Great Britain. And when the Germans walked through Europe and conquered the, conquered the continent and then turned its attention to England, my mother was concerned that if Hitler won, he conquered England swiftly as was expected, what would happen to England's colonies after what had been controlled? two-thirds of the world's population. Control India, control China, control a lot of places in Africa, a lot of places in the Caribbean and other parts of the world. And what they did not control, the French control. And what they and the French did not control, the Dutch control. So when this great war came and was concerned about what happened, so after having gone to Jamaica and the age of a year and a half, was the city so intimidated. She had to take this to a place where she thought, where she thought being raised by the village was a greater <laughs> of 
opportunity that sprung in the systems in Harlem and cruelty to the oppression of that experience. Many in my family were involved with issues of law, and since they could not find an honorable place inside the rules of law, like many other immigrants, they stepped outside the law. And uh, I'm sure many here, and it's just an assumption I've heard of the numbers business. I've heard of the bottle. I've heard of the people. Uh, and it was an interesting thing because that whole configuration and regulation for the gambling uh, culture was created by a West Indian. A group of West Indian. Anybody who has ever played the numbers, I'll play them here now. <laughs> A lot of people can say there's a bunch of Cubans and Jamaicans and people who sat down and figured that out. And a lot of people in my family were involved in it. My mother didn't like it that much. And she constantly steered us to places where other choices resided. But she, and taking me back to Jamaica was a way in which to enhance that possibility into the war. When I was 12 years old, she brought us back to America. And from that time until now, I resided here. I was born here, and I am an American citizen. And I got my birth certificate. <laughs> <laughs> It is just now that 
still loved the picture was that I was the janitor. Now you've been a janitor, I was a janitor's assistant. One day, because this is the work that I did at the end of the war, I was tending to an apartment. It was a problem. I was asked to repair it. I did it skillfully and brilliantly. We were trying to fix a Venetian blind. A Venetian blind or glass. It's a key thing. <laughs> but I did. And I was in war after that. I had two tickets to a theater in Harlem called the American Negro Theater. A little place at the bottom of a library, uh, Schoenberg. And at the bottom of this library, I went to see what was a play. How does this thing work? I couldn't even take a date because I didn't have any money, so I sat by myself. <laughs> and then the curtain went up, and the players launched into the demands of the play. I had an epiphany. I saw people using themselves and their minds and their hearts and their passion, servicing information impact upon and to influence the way others would think. And I saw this as a very powerful place in which to be involved. And I begged them to let me become part of the school. I didn't have the credentials to become a direct member, but I could clean up, I could hang around, I could do a lot of things, and I could help the school get its needs to open the door on a daily basis. It was here. I met Ozzie Davis when we Sydney Park together. I imagine it's rarely as possible. <laughs> <laughs> that sense of love, I think, I don't know. But in this environment, many of us have come to it with the same set of experiences. Sydney was from the Caribbean, I had no education, so dropped out, sleeping in the streets of New York as a homeless young man from the Second World War. We looked up and talked about the stuff. And as he made his came back, quite heroic from what he did in the service during the Second World War, we looked up and talked about it. And so this little nucleus of folks became my first hum in the pursuit of truth. Where I got lucky with the man and used the resources of the GI Bill of Rights to go learn, it led me to the new school of social an institution highly praised for its avant-garde look at education, its style, its curriculum, the way it did things. And it was this German by the name of